the more that you see that as wrong or the more that you see that as working against you or the more that you judge that, the more it's going to happen. How do you live without fear? You have previously mentioned on Instagram that you got over your fear of flying. How did you do that? I will tell you. It's been a process and I don't actually know how, but I'll share with you all my all my mindsets, my tools, my tips, tricks, everything that I've learned up until this point. I will tell you that you don't actually have to be free of that for you to be happy and for you to be a thriving human being. I think that these things are natural. We all get intrusive thoughts. We can be the most awakened, transcended being, and we're still human. So these are human things, human fears. They're so ingrained into our unconscious, especially since the entire prime directive of your unconscious is rooted in survival. It is natural for you to consider survival, okay? So the more that you see that as wrong or the more that you see that as working against you or the more that you judge that, the more it's going to happen. Okay, because what you resist persists. So instead of that, what I like to do is I like to just see it as like, huh, my unconscious is working perfectly. Thank you so much for having my safety and security in consideration. Like, I know you got this unconscious. You are constantly monitoring my safety and security so that I can play in dream time, dreamland, la la land, visualize and like that. Okay, thank you so much. So when you see that the job is being taken care of by your unconscious, It's like the feminine and masculine polarity, the masculine being your unconscious, focusing on certainty, security, and safety allows your feminine to be free. Okay. That's number one. Number two is fear of flying. So let me give you some background real quick for anyone who doesn't know my story. I used to be deathly afraid of flying, like panic attacks four or five nights in advance. If I have a flight on my calendar, I mean, it just, you know how you can open your calendar and I I don't know, I use a MacBook, I have Apple. So the iCal comes up and you can kind of preview what you have going on for the next month. Well, going back to like an old version of myself, if I see that I have a flight on like the 21st and we're right now in like the, the third of the month, I mean, it will just, my mind zooms right into the 23rd. It makes it so big. It makes it so overpowering that I cannot focus on anything else on my calendar. It's just, it completely encompasses my mind. Um, And that fear of flying came from a trauma that didn't actually manifest into a trauma, but my experience of it was a trauma. Kind of confusing. Let me quickly explain. This was shortly after 9-11. So of course this was top of mind for lots of people, you know, like, oh my God this can happen shit. And, um, I think it was like 2002 or something like that. I was a kid. I was going to Mexico with my dad on a vacation. Um, and on our way back from Cancun to Los Angeles on this flight, this flight, I think was Aero Mexico, or I I forgot the name of the exact airline. I'm sure you guys would know better than I do, especially if you go to Mexico a lot and fly their airlines. Um, I just now typically like, we don't go to Mexico very often. If we do, it'll be like, American Airlines or something like that, or JetBlue or whatever. So anyway, um, back then it was um, a crew that mostly spoke Spanish, some English. And so there's a lot of Spanish speaking on the plane. And all of a sudden, I remember hearing weird, strange sounds in the engine for some reason. And then all of a sudden there's like three flight attendants running up and down the aisle crying. So where the f- do you think my brain went? <laughs> As uh, how old is I? 11, 12 years old. Like, where do you think my brain went? obviously this plane has been hijacked and we're about to create the next 9-11 in Los Angeles. So I remember waking up my dad because of course, as a child, you want your parent to be like, no, it's okay. I'll protect you. Well, I woke up my dad, he was taking a nap and he literally said the most like demeaning, just minimizing, diminishing. Shit. I don't remember what he said. And basically I was like, I'm on my own. I'm on safe. I'm on my own. Oh my God, we're going to die. And nothing ended up happening. Like literally the flight has calmed down. I have no idea what happened because I don't speak Spanish. We landed. We're fine. Still fine to this day. But it caused a trauma. And so ever since then, I could not get on a plane without constant. Like I would, I've taken courses where, um, so ridiculous. I would take courses where taught by pilots that were aimed at people of fear of flying and, um, 
it was like this pilot telling you exactly what sounds are normal and what sounds are not normal and, ex- and the timing of it. I, I don't know if it made it better or worse, to be honest, but I know so much more about planes and altitudes and minutes and speeds and this and that. I'm that person who needs to open up the tracker and, and track exactly like what is our altitude at what time and this is this normal? Is this not normal? Like literally ridiculous. And then I remember begging my mom for therapy. I'm like, can you take me to therapy? I had no idea what therapy was. I had no idea that things like talk therapy don't really work for fears and things like that. So I just remember begging my mom for a therapist. Okay. So didn't get a therapist. There was no prioritizing that at the time. And um, my only last option was to bring it up to my doctor and he gave me Xanax. So I used to only get on airplanes with Xanax. And if it was a two hour flight, I would take the tiniest little dosage as possible. And this shit knocked, I mean, it knocked me out. Like it was, I don't know. I don't know what this doctor was thinking. Like I bet the dose is way too high for me. Cause I remember I would take it and just like fall asleep for 24 hours. Like I don't think that's normal, but that was just my only option to get on a flight because here is the internal conflict. I love travel more than anything on this planet. Okay. Besides my family love travel. You know me, you've seen my Instagram. If you've been following me at all, you know, I'm always in some other country city, this and that, whatever. I love, love, love to travel. So that was a huge internal conflict. I'm like, huh, deathly afraid of flying, but every place I want to go to requires a flight. So I never stopped flying. I made that very clear. And I know now Knowing what I know about the unconscious, what John taught me with the gas station fear, if you've heard that podcast episode with um, me having a fear of gas stations that just developed as soon as I got pregnant, which I realized was a past life fear. And he helped me do a past life regression and heal that. And yes, I went to a gas station the other day and filled up my car and was completely fine. So <laughs> it's, uh, I would say it's still like one or 2% there, but he said the trick is to not stop going to gas stations, like stop avoiding what you're afraid of. Because the more that you avoid it, the more you make it a big deal. Even if you're literally shaking in your boots, like I used to hold on to strangers' hands and squeeze their knees. I'm not even joking. Like I could give two fucks. I was that afraid. There were certain flights when there was turbulence that I would just stare at the seat in front of me. I mean, it was painfully long. Like imagine just staring at the seat in front of you for five fucking hours because you're just frozen in fear. That feels like 25 hours. It feels like 37 hours. It's so fucking long. And so knowing what I know now, I'm like, thank God I never stopped flying. I never avoided it because in the absence of avoiding it, in pursuing it, with whatever tool I can muster, of course, thank God I know better tools now than just to take a Xanax, that helped my unconscious attach safety to planes. Because when you pursue something, your unconscious thinks to itself, huh, this must be safe because she is going out of her way to pursue it. Even if you feel all the sensations of fear, even if you have all the thoughts or whatever, like your unconscious eventually gets the message that this is safe. The reason why the gas station thing blew up so much for me out of proportion is because I avoided gas stations. I avoided them. I made sure that my Brennan would always fill up the tank. I'd be that person who would have like 10 miles left on her car, (laughs) on her G-Wagon and be like, and have an appointment that's like a mile away because where I lived, it was like, there was a lot of stuff around me. So I would go and make most of my appointments in the Beverly Hills area. And so I'm like, that's a mile away, whatever. I can get gas tomorrow. And I just kept avoiding and avoiding and avoiding and avoiding and avoiding. So I'm really grateful that unconsciously somehow I never stopped avoiding flights. The next thing that happened is my mom told me this story. Who the fuck knows if it's a real story, fake story? I don't know. But my mom, where my grandma grew up, was a part of Russia that was on a military base. There was a, not a military base, but it was actually, sorry, it was not a military base. It was a training ground for helicopters. So a lot of um, people in the army, in the Russian military, if they had any desire to learn to be whatever, to be a pilot, a helicopter pilot, they would go to this training ground. 
And my mom was telling me how there's this whole dynamic of like all the women in this town wanted to marry one of the helicopter pilots because it meant their ticket out of Russia because these helicopter pilots would get stationed in other places. This is how my mom grew up in um, Algeria. She's Russian, but she grew up in Algeria because uh, her father was a helicopter pilot and stationed in Algeria. So my grandma married one of those helicopter pilots. She got her ticket out of Russia. And that's why they were also why I was born in Ukraine. My mom married a Ukrainian, so I'm both Russian and Ukrainian, which is, of course, an interesting dynamic in this day and age um, to be both. But um, yeah, my mom's fully Russian. My dad is like 75% Ukrainian. And she was then stationed, I, my grandpa, biological, was stationed in Ukraine. So that's how I was born in Ukraine is because that's where my mom grew up. But my grandma grew up in this town. And long story short, my point with all this is that she was telling me a story of how there was, I think they were in training or this happened somewhere else, but whatever, it was helicopter pilots. They had a mission or they had a task or an activity or something like that where they flew and at some point the helicopter crashed, okay? Like something went wrong, they fell to the ground and they crashed. Well, all three of them survived. It was a fucking miracle, but they survived. And then they got rescued by another helicopter. So now there's four of them because someone's got to fly the plane to get them, the helicopter to get them, picks them up and they crash again. They again survive. And I don't remember if this is where the story ends or they actually get into a helicopter again, another one, because it crashed again, and then they die that time. It doesn't fucking matter. The metaphor here being that these people are meant to get in a crash. These people were either meant to die or meant to survive. I forgot which one, but the unconscious like representation and the lesson that I got was, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. That's it. I cannot control it. And this landed for me when I went to a Tony Robbins event. I went to Date with Destiny, I think, or I was flying to Date with Destiny or from Date with Destiny. I forgot. And I remember looking out the window and just being like, Catherine, if you're meant to be here, nothing's going to happen to you. And if you're not, it will. And you have zero control over it. That's it. Zero control. Okay. And for some reason in that moment, it landed for me. And for some reason, in that moment, I could feel about 80% of the fear of flying just completely disappear. It was like I finally felt in purpose with my life. And I just knew that intuitively, like I still have purpose. And so nothing's going to happen to me. I don't know why. I just landed that way. And then through my journey of learning what I'm teaching you in MBA, I started implementing tools. So it's about nervous system regulation. It's about bringing safety into your body when you feel unsafe. So now when I get on planes, I do a lot of breath work. I do a lot of breathing. I use EFT. I use the tools that I give you. They work. Whenever there's turbulence, I would tap through it. Whenever there's turbulence, I would do the eight second out breath. So in inhale, one, two, three, four, hold for four seconds, and then through a straw for eight seconds. You can also do two really fast inhales, so through the nose, and then, which I learned from Andrew Huberman, which I also like. So I use those tools. And that, in combination of we keep traveling, we keep going, we're not telling our unconscious that this is unsafe, we're going to keep pursuing it, over time, it just dissipated and dissipated and dissipated. Now, if I told you it's 100% not there, I'd totally lie to you. I would say there's still a percent of me, but I think that that's natural. And that's where I tell you, like, don't make this a bad thing. The fact that your unconscious is focused on your safety, don't make it a bad thing. Sometimes there is turbulence and I have that, like, my heart skips a beat moment. And I'm like, Ugh! you know, like, ah, we're fine. Breathe. <laughs> right and so I use my tools I do my thing say a prayer if it helps you I mean use the tools this is why we do the stuff that we do is because we're building our we're expanding our capacity 
to handle things that are stressful to our nervous systems. And as we expand our capacity, it would have to take a really big thing to throw us off kilter. So I was landing in Vegas from Austin the other day, and it was just a roller coaster down. I mean, roller coaster. Las Vegas is so windy to begin with. The desert does something to turbulence like crazy. And then on top of that, there was like really bad wind. This is to show you that like I was completely fine. Now, is there a faster route to this? Absolutely. I talk about rapid resolution therapy like crazy. I'm on repeat about it. I actually had someone email me saying they they saw someone for RRT for fear of flying and now they want to fly and come have lunch with me. Um, this is the owner of Mama Meals. It's a postpartum like um, food company, like a postpartum meals company, pre-made postpartum meals. And she was like, I just had RRT for fear of flying. I want to book a flight like immediately. Like I just want to just do it after the session can I get, have lunch with you in Vegas? Cause it's a short flight and then I'll just fly back home. And I'm like, sure, let's do it. That's awesome. 